Welcome to Business Not 101, a podcast that explores the uncommon side of business. I'm your host, Olivier Bousset. In today's founder interview series, we are joined by Mimi Boyi, founder of Happy on Monday and Business Coaching, helping online entrepreneurs scale their business through authentic marketing and leadership. Hi, Mimi. How are you? I'm good. I'm excited. Thank you. And uh, thanks for joining me today. I really appreciate that. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. So let's get right into it. First question. I always ask everybody, 60 second business pitch. Tell me everything about Happy on Mondays. Yes. So Happy on Mondays is my mission, my life mission. But what I do with clients is I help them build businesses that are really fully aligned with their authentic self. And we do that through high ticket coaching and online marketing that is completely genuine and real and authentic. So what was the aha moment behind it? What made you suddenly go, this is my calling instead of working nine to five at a company? Ooh, well, it was more like an evolution. So it's not something that just happened. It's my whole journey really evolved from the moment I realized I was very unhappy on Mondays. I had the haha moment that I needed to change something in my life. Like there was just one life to live and I couldn't live my life that w- that way. And so that's when I had the idea of happy on Mondays. And it was just a motto. It was not a business. It was not you know, a concept or anything like that. It was literally just the way I wanted to live my life from this point forward. And from that decision, I started experimenting. So the first thing that I had like an idea was to become a consultant in HR to help companies improve their employee engagement. It kind of made sense with the happy on Monday's vibes. And I started working on on this project. And eventually, very soon, I got hired in a company as an HR leader. And this led me on a journey of realizing that it was not quite it. There was something else that I, I was missing and craving. And so from that job and that role, I started coaching because you know, as an HR professional, you're constantly coaching employees and even the leaders in in that startup. And so from that experience started my career coaching business, which happened organically. People were just curious about how I had made some transitions in my career and how I was able to go from sales to HR and really like navigate those pivots very like effortlessly. And so from always having requests to go on coffee dates and to get their my insights on their pivots i decided to start doing this like more professionally and start my career coaching side hustle which grew and grew and grew to the point where i was able to go full-time in my business and at that point people started asking other questions like oh my god how did you do it how did you go full-time in your business which then led me to teach them how to start their own side hustle and then their own full-time business. So that's kind of how it all evolved, but it all started from that unhappy place in the corporate world. <laughs> that's super interesting. And re- now we're connected on LinkedIn and I remember seeing your posts. And so I've sort of followed you very quickly through your, a big part of your career just by seeing the posts. And I was always amazed at the speed in which you grew an audience. And one of the questions people always ask me is like, you know, when I do this, I always struggle to get an audience. Did you find that was one of your roadblocks was getting an audience? Or is it something that came naturally, just ready from all your connections and sort of just cultivated them? Hmm. I'd say that it's never been the intention behind what I was sharing online. So I think that's the biggest mistake some people make. They post so that they can have an audience, right? I started posting as a self-expression tool really to share a message, share my mission. And it was not with the intention to grow an audience, but it was more with the intention of of really sharing my passion out there, right? And it started from that beautiful energy. So when I started putting myself out there, it resonated because it, it was coming from a really genuine place. And rapidly people with you know, the tagline happy on Monday started to really engage and, and, you know, tag other people. And it just grew very organically from that point. 
So my advice on that is really do it because you care, because you're passionate about something, like some type of mission, some type of motto, some type of, I don't know, like purpose. And then just do it for you first. And then you're going to attract a lot of people from that place. So it was a completely organic. It was just sort of came along. Yes. And, and in starting your business, what was your biggest roadblock then? Was it just getting over the hump and realizing I can charge for this? Or was it something that, you know, getting a business started and getting people to pay attention to you? Was- hmm. Well, challenges have evolved quite a bit. So it's like, When I started, the biggest challenge was to see my own value, see my own gifts and and understand how this could be converted into a business that for sure I like had struggled with uh, for probably a few months when I was side hustling. It was like I was trying to crack a code, but really the answers were already within me, but I was not seeing them. So that was the biggest thing when I started the journey. Now, along the way, there's been many different challenges, one of them being the, 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 the capacity to adapt to different needs constantly evolving. So not being so attached to one idea because my business evolved so much in the past three years and being able to kind of be flexible with that and, and follow, follow my intuition and follow where my, my market was kind of leading me at. Very interesting. So it, it really was, you had sort of like self-doubt, right? So like we, we go through that, like, am I really the right person to do this job? Am I equipped to do it? I think that self-doubt is something that every entrepreneur goes through. And that's that's really uh, sort of normal, but it's scary as well. And so that was your hardest point. And then from there, when you got over your the, the self-doubt and you start to amplify the energy that was inside you and said, okay, you know what? I can do this and I can help people do this. You went from helping individuals to realizing you can actually sort of a fleet of coaches to mm-hmm. help multiple people. Mm-hmm. When did you decide that was the spot for you, that you were going to teach other people to become coaches? It, it's funny. It, it almost seems like I haven't decided. It's more that my people decided for me. So the way I do my business is I have a vision of what I want to create for myself. And while I'm going for it, I'm documenting the process. So what that does, it it attracts people who want to create something similar to what I created today and and are on the same path towards what I'm creating for tomorrow. So because of that, because I was so excited about the coaching world, because I was loving my life, because I was loving the work I was doing with clients, I attracted people who wanted that. And so they came to me and I said, yeah, I can help you. Like it kind of so, happened. So that they way. came to see you and said, "Can you teach me what you're doing?" Yeah. Wow, that's incredible. That's some. Yeah. That's that's a testament to your skills because that's somebody's catching that you can teach them as opposed to just helping them, which is something that not everybody sees. Mm-hmm. That's very interesting. Yeah, and that it also brings me to like the concept of in marketing of attraction versus you trying to push something onto people. It's more like. You become a magnet for people who want what you created when you focus on just showing what you're great at and just like just sharing your passion instead of like trying to figure out what people want to hear. If you talk about what you like and what you're up to, then the right people will follow and will want to be part of that journey with you. Yeah. And that's a really interesting aspect. So one of the articles I had sent along to you was a thousand true fans. And it's an article about how to build up your first fans, really the people that are going to go and support you. What, what, how did you come about doing this? Was this something that you started off with a foundation of people that you already knew, your LinkedIn connections, your, your friends and family? Or did you say, I'm going to start a clean slate because this is sort of something that was outside of my normal nine to five? Mm-hmm. Well, it, in my journey, it started in person. So what I did before I was in the online world is I started a meetup series here in Toronto. So when I moved here in Toronto, I was in the corporate world, but eventually I decided to like start my own thing. And I knew no one in the city because I'm from Montreal originally. I'm a French Canadian and, you know, I came to the big city in Toronto and I started just working in my nine to five, but I was kind of just with my blinders on and I was not really mingling with the community at all. So when I started my meetups, no one knew me in the city. I was like a complete stranger. 
But what I did is I started going and attending different events in the city. And I started introducing myself to everyone I could meet, like as many people in person that I could. And I would, I would tell them like, oh, I, I'm starting this, this thing called Happy on Mondays. I'm going to do meetups very soon. Like, I'd love to stay connected. Can you follow me on Instagram? Right. And I started just creating that network really like door to door, like, like really yeah. in person. That's really and smart. Yeah. And every opportunity that I had during those events that I was attending, if they had an opportunity to go and pitch at the end, because some events had that, like a 30 second open mic, right? To come in and just introduce yourself and say what you're, what you're up to and do like an elevator pitch. I would go in front of the crowd and I would just say, Hey, I'm Mimi. I'm the founder of Happy on Mondays. I'm building this meetup series. Here's where you can follow me. I'm really excited to share this with you. And I would go and just pitch every time I could. So it was really done organically one person at a time. That's how it started the, the whole, my whole like network. And then slowly, of course, as you start having those people following you on different platforms, as you start putting yourself out there every single day, that's something that I did on LinkedIn for like in 2019. I, I did videos every single day, one video a day. And that itself also helped me grow the network very quickly. That's really smart. So I love the, the, the way you went about it. It's very organic. You're going to meetups. Now that takes a certain character because I think somebody who's very shy or very nervous would struggle with that. Is that your character to be so out, out there and you have no problems? You're not scared of anything? Or is it something that you hit really well and you just jumped into it and said, I have to do this? I think I'm really great at one-on-one. -on -one. Like I, I, I can easily connect with a new person. That's for sure. But in terms of like going in front of a crowd and speaking, that was definitely not my cup of tea before. I used to practice in front of a mirror multiple times a day to just like memorize all the words because also I'm, I'm French, right? So I thought, oh my God, if I don't say the words the right way, my pronunciation might not be good and people won't get it. And I was like getting in my head around that. And I was really preparing myself to do those like 30 second elevator pitches. So definitely that was not my, my strength before but I wanted it. I really had this vision for myself that I would be a great communicator. So I started practicing and simply by introducing myself, shaking hands and, or doing those pitches. And that was my way of, of getting that skill. Excellent. Excellent. Did you, any a given time, once you started to grow momentum and you got your organic uh, group and your following, did you go and look for paid advertisements or did you start looking at affiliate programs to sort of promote yourself? Or did you say, you know what, I'm just going to continue down this path of solely one-on-one -on -one and then grow my audience and my membership? Well, what happened is with the meetups, we had some sponsors that were sponsoring the events. So that was like my first way of monetizing the business it was through sponsors and, and partnerships with with the events but then when i pivoted to online coaching which again happened organically because i just felt like the meetups were not getting me like the same i guess the same outcome than a post on linkedin could for example if i was hosting a meetup there was a hundred people which was amazing but then one post on linkedin could give me like 5,000 views easily. Right. And I have had some posts that went like completely viral. So it was like, is it really where my, where my future is headed, right? Events in person. And I think I was like, also kind of like seeing in the future that, you know, in person events could not be a thing of the future. So yeah, I, who would have known, right? <laughs> who would have known, but, but I'm glad I did that pivot. Definitely. And when I went on my business, what I, what I started with was really organically promoting myself. So I, I, I didn't do any ads or anything like that, but I started with one-on-one -on -one coaching. So signing one-on-one -on -one coaching clients one at a time. Yeah, that's, so that's really interesting. And I agree with you, Meetup actually is a, a great platform to meet people, but it's also something that's very weak. It, it's hard to communicate, keep track. And it's something that it's, you can 
start something there. And if it's very simple and very local, you could do it. But uh, I agree. A lot of people who've tried to monetize meetups or to create something from it have struggled. So that's yeah. interesting. So you, you've switched, you went and converted before the pandemic, I'm assuming, to yes. online. And so when you create these online courses, how do you feel like it's the, you continue the momentum? Because obviously if you're busy teaching, wow. then you're getting people to, you still have to go on LinkedIn to create posts and create that the sort of like the buzz around your events. Do you, do you use your customers also as referral programs to start getting you other customers? Are they your primary way of getting new customers? Is there a question? Yes. So I do have a referral program but this is not my primary way. So this is something that is great, additional new clients coming into my world. But the main, I guess, way of getting clients is still my own organic marketing uh, strategy. So how to balance this, this whole thing? So I'd say it evolved quite a bit as I scaled the business. When I started, it was quite manageable because I had just a few private clients at a time. So I could be maybe coaching you know, five hours a week with five clients, let's say. So I had like plenty of time to do my marketing and do my discovery calls as well. But eventually I scaled to a point where I had like over 20 discovery calls a month. Plus I had 15 private clients at the same time. So I was like coaching for at least 20 hours a week, plus discovery calls in my calendar all the time, plus my marketing. So at some point, something had to change. Like I was a bit burnt yeah. out, to be honest, by the end of like 2019. And at that point, I hired my first team member. I shifted my model from one-on-one -on -one coaching to group coaching to now be able to serve more people, but with less time. So those shifts happen all again, organically as the business evolved and more resources were available for me to expand the team. Excellent. So the first person you hired, was it marketing? I'm assuming it was a virtual assistant. That was oh, my very interesting. first hire. Yeah. That's good. That's a, you're the third person who's had a virtual assistant and there's, it's a, it's a great to have. I think it's something a lot of businesses should look into because it's something that you need that extra little help. Did you start looking at, did they take on more roles or are they stayed only in that small virtual assistant role or did you start getting them to do more marketing? A lot of people struggle with marketing and getting help in marketing. Mm. Did you start looking for an outside firm or are you still doing your own marketing? I do my own. This is like the most important portion of my business because it's all about genuine, authentic content. So I cannot outsource this. No one will do it better than me. <laughs> no offense, but like the creative genius is me. So it is definitely my zone of genius. And ha no, like I've tried it. That's the funny part is with my virtual assistant at some point, I tried different things to kind of like remove a little bit from my plate, but it felt really icky. It didn't feel authentic and I just decided not to do it anymore. So what I did for my virtual assistant, which we, I still have a virtual assistant helping me, is that I outsourced more and more and more administrative tasks and logistical task, right? When I have like calls with clients, I don't want to be managing like the invites and the links and all the things. So that's one thing that my virtual assistant does, right? So the more I grew, the less I'm doing the stuff that are not part of my zone of genius. Yeah, that's really interesting. And, and what I'm getting, at, I completely understand you are the brand, you are the product. So it's really, everything comes out of you. That, mm -hmm. that is a lot of extra work, right? To create that marketing. So now if I were to look at it and say, what would you tell somebody who's starting their business, whether it's consulting or freelancing in terms of marketing, mm. would you give them say, write stories about themselves or about their, their abilities? Where would you tell them to start? Certainly because you have a lot of expertise now for three years and you pivoted a couple of times mm -hmm. and you really know yourself and your stories, but where would you tell somebody who just starts off tomorrow? Or let's say one of your customers, what would be one of the key aspects that should focus on? Well, it's, it really depends on their focus, right? It depends if they're like a service provider doing, I don't know, like maybe they're doing marketing, advertisement, maybe they're doing graphic design. Like that's more like the service portion. I am really more like, I guess, knowledgeable with coaching and consulting, right? So anything that's more like a service that is coaching related. Yeah. So people facing, yes. 
Yes, correct. So my advice for these people, and that's something we we teach in, inside the, my programs, is like, you don't want to be teaching and coaching something that isn't part of who you are. Basically, if you're into coaching, there's a reason for that. There's a reason, there's a story behind that. There's something that you overcome. There has been a moment of like haha moment and, and breakthroughs that happen in your life that led you on this path. So start by sharing this story, sharing your own transformation, what you've been through, what you're embodying. And this becomes the, the, this becomes the marketing. This becomes like what you're selling. So that would be my, my advice. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. So you're basically saying, create your story, your background, which is really your branding and say, tell your story of why you're here, where, what brought you here and then amplify that. That's really interesting. That's, that's something you don't think about. It's really where branding starts. It's the story of the person. Yes. And, and once the person's created this, do you feel that their image plays a rich part of it, has a huge impact, certainly in, in coaching and consulting? Or do you feel that, no, it doesn't really make a difference? I think people make it mean something when it, it really shouldn't. So I'm going to be very careful in the way that I'm speaking about that. Obviously, like I'm a woman that's a white woman, right? I, I can only speak from my experience. But what I know for sure is that whether you're a man, woman, whatever is your gender, if you identify as a woman of color or not, if you're like, it really doesn't matter because there's someone that needs to see it from you, the way that you look, the way that you sound the way that you express yourself, the way that you're doing it, because that's going to give them the permission to do the same. So it would be a mistake to say like there is one physic for success because it's not true. Like I know so many amazing coaches out there that are crushing it with every gender, every size, every language, every, every way of expressing, expressing themselves. And really what makes them unique is their authenticity and their ability to stay true to themselves. And it's funny, I had like a, a coaching with one of my clients who was asking me a similar question. She was a bit self-conscious because she's, she was saying, I, I've never seen someone that looks like me, that that sounds like me out there online and it feels intimidating. Like, I feel like people will maybe laugh or not understand like what I'm all about. And I told her, I'm like, well, imagine, like imagine yourself a few years back watching you do it, how it would have absolutely changed the game for you, how it would have absolutely gave you the permission to go for it and do it yourself. And this is why you need to be the exception. You need to lead. You need to be that person who does it. It's so important. That's, that's really a great point. You become the voice to those people. And that's, that's an interesting aspect. So you're really creating not only your own brand image when you're teaching these, these people to become coaches, but you're also directing them to say, find your audience that, that looking for you. So yes. it is really something that's it's not easy because that is something that you can't just go out and plaster social media, you need to really find the people that are going to follow you. Yeah. And my opinion on that is, and I, I'm like very sensitive with language. So I'm like, I don't need to find the people who will follow me. They're going to find me. I need to make myself visible. And that's a big mind shift that I help clients with as well, because we tend to think that we need to find our people. And I'm saying that your people will find you. You just need to show up. You need to show up. And this for me is like deciding where you're, where you're really called to show up, right? For some people, LinkedIn is the vibe. For some others, they love podcasts like we're doing right now. There are people that just love talking. Some people, they don't want to talk. They just want to write. <laughs> some people will want to be on video all day long do whatever is aligned to you at the moment and start expressing your message and the right people will always, always find, find you. That's really well said. Yeah. Yeah. Let them come to you. And so from that point, when you are out there and you're really sort of like having to expose yourself, your emotional self, and your, because everything's out there, do you feel that it's a trait 
that's really a lot of coaches need to do is they need to show their emotional intelligence, the empathy, and they need to be really exposing themselves. So people feel like really a genuine connection, or do you feel like in certain coaching that's important other coaching? It's not as much. Well, the coaching I believe in, I would say, yes, it's definitely a big part of it. And it, it it's what I call self leadership is your ability to lead yourself through difficult situations because you know, it will happen. Not all days will be amazing. And it's your ability to show up even in those situations and not hide, but actually just share your learnings as you're going through difficult things. So when I look at my journey, the moments where I was the most vulnerable with my audience were the moments where I know I created so much trust with them. And I was not really doing it for that. I was doing it again for my, my own self-expression, for my passion of my work and, and my craft. But it's it, it showed people that I'm not I'm I'm not a superwoman. I'm I'm a regular person. I go through things all the time and I'm willing to talk about it because who would I be if I would just talk about my wins? Like if I'm not talking about what's really happening behind the scenes, does this really demonstrate leadership and someone that we want to work with? Not necessarily, because it doesn't show that you went through difficult times and you got yourself out of it and you're on this journey. So I find that so important and so powerful to do so. Well said. You know, and this makes me think of when you're, teaching coaches is you get to control a little bit the aspect of telling them what you've done, what you experienced, the successes and where you've had your failures. But when you see other people out there, whether it's a coach or a service, you know, a person facing uh, you know, business, what do you see the most people make mistakes with their marketing, their branding and really sort of their message that sort of makes you go, Ooh, that's not the way to do it. Mm. Well, I see a lot of people hiding behind quotes and like very generic messages, very like, I guess like blah yeah. <laughs> messages. And it, it's unfortunate because I know they're doing it. It's coming from a right place. It's coming from a place where they just want to inspire. They want to be positive. They want to share it. Like it's coming from a right place. And I also applaud their consistency because I, I see a lot of people posting consistently consistently those things. But in my opinion, in my experience, this will not lead you to have results because it doesn't really show why you, why you, right? Why should they work with you? I can read a book too. You know, I can read a book and post a quote, but what makes you, the person that they want to work with is when, is your ability to show them like your opinions on things, your polarizing thoughts, maybe your life experiences and how you navigated certain things in your life, the results of your clients, how your clients are crushing it, right? Or testimonials. Like these are the things that will actually excite people versus just quotes. Yeah, that's, that's really, that's a great point. I love that. And if you were to say, what's the key thing someone should do? Should they go off and look at their content or should they just say, you know what, let me piggyback on somebody else's content or some predefined content, or should I just create every day something new? Hmm. I see it more like a, so I would definitely tell them to create their own content. That's for sure. But I see it more like as a, an evolution. So you have a big message and then you live your life by this message. And as you're living your life by this message, things happen and you document things. So I use social media almost like my journal. When I go through something, when I have a discussion with a client, when I go through a difficult day, when I sign a new client, when I whatever, when I learn something new, I'm going to teach and share and, and post about it because I'm excited about it. Right. And, and it's, it's like real, it's happening in real time. So that's really how I see it. It's all aligned with the same message, the same direction, but it's like events happening, things that you document, just like if it was your, your personal journal. 
Very interesting. And you know what? It sort of exposes you though, right? Because now you're sort of putting your your fears, your your emotions on the table and saying, this is who I am. Mm-hmm. Whereas not necessarily everybody feels comfortable doing that. I think some people like to live behind a wall, like, you know, the f- facade. I'm, I'm like the Instagram person, but in real life, I'm a <laughs> person. And so that, that changes the dynamics because now your customers are getting to know you, Mimi, for you, not, or at least the Mimi that you're showing them and mm-hmm. not necessarily this, this sort of polished image of what you are. Totally. Does, does, when you start that and you have that conversation, because that's not natural, like it's not something I would do naturally. Do you have a lot of pushback from people? Certainly, like, let's say people like, like me who would say, whoa, I don't know if I feel comfortable saying this happened to me today. Do you get a lot of pushback? And do you see that the people who do embrace it are really moving forward and the other people who don't embrace it sort of fall back? Yes, there is definitely pushback. So there's a lot of muscle building that needs to happen. It's a muscle, right? I, I wasn't born a content creator, but I built myself as one. The reason is I have a strong why, and that's what I help my clients connect to as well. It's like, why am I doing this? Like if, if it's just kind of a thing you need to be doing, then it's really hard to actually do it. But when it's connected to a purpose, when you feel like this is in alignment with where you're headed, with who you're becoming, with what you're creating, with the brand that you desire, then it becomes just effortless to, to start and try. It won't go from like nothing to, oh my God, you're posting every single day all the time on stories and all the things, but slowly you take daily actions and it's the growth is exponential. So what I help clients with is really change their identity. That's where mindset is important. It's it's not so much about forcing yourself to post, but it's really changing how you perceive yourself as a content creator as a business owner and start really wearing that hat now every day. And it's like, all of a sudden, oh yeah, of course, like I'm doing a podcast. Hey, actually, let me take a picture of that right now so that I can post it. Boom, done. You know, it becomes super easy and it's part of who you you are. So changing the identity will help change the behavior. So many coaches try to do the opposite. They're like, go, 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 post every day. And it's all behavior and and kind of environment focused, but it's not going up to the identity level, which trickles down into behaviors of the person. So you really start getting into their core and showing them there's other alternatives and really sort of having to get them to open up. You're really sort of like, that's a, that's a lot to take in. So it must be really intensive the first couple of days in your course. I can only imagine because that's a lot to take in. Certainly for somebody that says an introvert, you basically have to break open like a walnut and be like, okay, you got to expose, but do it mm-hmm. in the right way. That's brilliant. Totally. I love that. It's it's for sure something that not all people are are like ready for, and this is why my marketing is very clear. Like what you see is what you get. So if you are not aspiring to create something like what I created, then I'm not the right coach for you. And that's totally fine. Right. So that's also where I'm I'm really genuine and real with people. Like if they're drawn to me, there's a reason it's because they have, there's something about me that they want to learn. So of course I'm going to teach them the whole thing. But if it's someone that is like, Oh my God, I could never do this. Then most likely we're not a match and that's cool. That's okay too. Yeah. Does it happen a lot that you lose customers midway through a coaching program and saying, you know what, this is not for me or does that happen? Or is that really rare? This is, this is so rare because it, it's going to happen prior to the coaching engagement. Like we have basically a process to qualify, make sure that there's a fit, right? Both ways fit for us, but also a fit for the person. So we're both going to validate that prior to working together. So it doesn't really happen though. That's really smart. So you sort of pre-validate the customers and customers pre-validate you and you have a conversation sort of yes. like starting up. That That's wise. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, because our process is so in-depth and very not hands-on because I don't really like this this expression. I don't like to be, I, I don't have control on their business. I empower my my coaches to grow their business, but I'm very close to them because we created basically a program that's kind of like a mastermind. It's a hybrid between a group coaching and a mastermind program. So it is intimate and there's like a lot of hands-on coaching, which is why we want to vet people. We want to make sure it's a fit with the group, that everyone has similar objectives, that 
everyone wants to build similar build businesses and we're basically the best coaches for them. That's really interesting. So I, mm -hmm. I do workshops every so often and every workshop has that one person that asks a lot of questions, but almost as though they're, they are challenging you to push mm -hmm. the limit. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned that. I think, I think because now I, I have some understanding on different types of learners. So it helped me really get comfortable with creating workshops that are going to to cater to every type of learner. So the person you're describing right now is a what if learner. These people are like listening to you, but they're suspicious a little bit. They're like, hmm, but what if this happened? How will that affect, right? And they have a lot of questions so that they can connect dots in their mind. So those people are amazing. It's just that you, you want to present information in a certain way so that you can help those people process what they're hearing from you, right? So what if learners, this is why a portion of your training, usually I do that by the end of a training, is like very much centered around basically Q&A, right? Questions, and, and I address those things. I'm like, okay, so I'm sure people in the, in the room might have questions like, what if this happens? And I help them start the, the ball rolling with questions and I help them fill the gaps, basically. But there's also different types of learners, like the why learners. So people that just need to understand why they should even listen to what you're about to tell them. So at the beginning of a workshop, I always, I always let them know why it's important to listen. Like whether I, I talk about like why I discovered that and, and how it affected me. So the results I got from it. So, hey, stay tuned. You need to listen to this. Like it's, it's worth your time, right? whatever, but you explain the why. Some people are what learners. They're like, I want the facts. They want all the facts and they're going to want to really understand like all the tiny details. And because of that, like you have to give them a little bit of that. And then there, there's the how learners. So how learners, they want to understand how they can do it. Like they want to do it now. So can you give them an exercise or something to take away that they can implement right away? So I'd say that before knowing that, that was very confusing as well. And I felt sometimes almost attacked by, by certain people because like they're doing their best. Like they they really don't mean that, but sometimes by asking questions, they put us in a uncomfortable position. Right. Yeah. That's really interesting. I love that you have like different classifications for everyone. That's it. I wish that we can get all the why people together and all the what if people, because it may make it a lot easier. But it's, it's always been one of your pet peeve is when people get very aggressive at the beginning and mm. then, then they feel like, okay, well, I get what you're saying. And then mm. they calm down and then they usually are the biggest champions at the end. And that's something I always totally. noticed. I thought it was weird. It's like, you were so aggressive with me, but now we're like, like you're going to give me a hug at the end. And it, it's interesting and I love it. But at the same time, it is something discerning when you, you get that person. So, all right. That was great. I love it. I love all your answers. So now I'm going to lead in because we have a pause in our conversation into the rapid round questions because I think this is so interesting. Cool. So I'm going to ask you a few random questions and just what's on top of your head. Let's go. Are you ready? Yes. Perfect. First question. How do you stay productive? Hmm. My Google calendar is saving my life. I love it so much. I have everything time blocked. It's like a freaking crazy domino effect in there. I, a lot of color codings and yeah, that's how I do it. Oh, then I'm not going to ask you the second question, which was how do you manage your time? Now I know. So I'm going to go over another one. What is the one device you cannot live without? My that's phone. Oh yeah. Same thing for me. <laughs> yeah. My husband is like sometimes annoyed. I have my phone with me all the time. Yeah. It's uh, it's oftentimes the case for entrepreneurs, I think. That's yeah. A one. What is the one book you would suggest the people taking your courses to read? The one single book like you have to read this if you really want to understand. Happy Pocket Full of Money. This is the best book ever. It is very spiritual, but it helps you really understand the concept of money. And it's quite fascinating because when we're building a business, most likely or not, you're going to face some resistance around charging and pricing and your relationship with money and your your capacity to hold that money and invest money, like all these things. So this book has changed my life and I recommend it all the time to all my students. 
I love that. This is one that I like. It's my personal question is how do you manage stress? Hmm. Wow. That's a really great one. Well, I'd say that I've kind of not had a lot of stress in my life in a long time because I've designed a business where I do really what I enjoy doing. Right. And so for me, like the stress that I used to have around coaching clients, like I don't have anymore. So the stress now comes more with my business growth and objectives and big goals that I have and investments I want to make and these types of, of stresses. But the best way that I manage it is really voicing it. So I talk, I talk it through. So I love to talk with my husband, but I'm also a self-projected projector. I don't know if you're into human design, but this means that in order for me to process any type of stress decision, anything that's big, I need to hear my voice talking it through. And it's not about having an opinion when I'm talking to someone. It's just about letting it out. And as I'm talking, I'm hearing my voice and it's making me feel a certain way and it helps me process and make a decision or deal with something like stress or something like that. So that would be my my way of dealing with it. That's so funny. I do the same thing when I walk my dog and I think my dog thinks I'm crazy talking to him the whole time. <laughs> so good. I love that. Well, Thank you so much for taking the time. I loved everything we learned today. So much information, so much to take away from this. So I want to say a big thank you to you. Thank you. It was so fun. I so appreciate you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. 